Michel? You mentioned that uh, the perfect clinic ma master comes in response to the seeking of the disciple. On one hand. On the other hand, you said one day that the perfect master, he choose, chooses one soul and then that soul becomes marked. So how, how does it uh, both are correct statement. The perfect living master comes with his list of souls or seekers. Souls may not know that. So when he comes, they all become seekers. That means he makes the seekers too. Right? But once they are made seekers, then he appears in the human form in their life by coincidence as their perfect living master in response to their seeking. So he makes them seeker before he appears. Then once they are seeking, he appears. And he chooses them before to become seekers, to be yes. seekers, so that he comes back later on and then marks them. Maybe later on, maybe shortly after they start seeking. It depends. Because seeking is not a one-time thing, you know, it takes place in several lifetimes. One keeps on seeking and when the seeking is intense and it is accompanied by a feeling of disillusionment from this world. This is not my place, I belong somewhere else. When that feeling comes along with the seeking, the master appears in his life. Yes? In a similar kind of vein, the spiritual light, when we meditate or when we, the spiritual light we get when we do devotion goes seven generations forward and seven generations backward. He makes them seekers the same way for so seven generations. Yep, so we, we could have been the beneficiary of that light. So you, you become beneficiary of so many other souls too. They get marked that way. So the question, I read somewhere very nice, it's not that uh, God qualifies, that God chooses the qualified. He qualifies the ones he chooses. So of course it's a semantic thing because the mind likes the semantics, otherwise the process is in no time, so it's not one or the other. It's the same thing. We can we know that experience is happening when we get, like Jamal saying, the urge to go see our master, or we realize this world is not our own. Yes, that urge comes, and that's an intense form of seeking. When the feeling that you want to have, uh, to look at the master, to meet him, a good form of seeking. When you miss the master, form of seeking. A good form of seeking. Yes, Julieta. Okay, <laughs> so when Master takes us back to Sachkhand and uh, then uh, we are here and then uh, he has to come back again to us to pick up other souls, so he leaves us over here? Just no, no, Master is there and here at the same time. Oh. He doesn't go and come. Okay. <laughs> He's here and there at the same time. Okay. You see him in his physical body here, he's in Sachkhand at the same time. We don't know that, but he knows. We can't see that, but he can see. He can see Sachkhand and this world at the same time. We can only see one at a time. That's why we feel he has taken us to Sachkhand, but he's been there already. Yes, Mark. On several occasions, you said that for the good devoted disciple, one life is the standard, not three eh, or two or four. But on the other hand, you say, so there are friends here around who are very devoted and they are back here. Why? Swamiji of Agra in one of his poems says, I'll quote in Hindi and then translate for you. Ek janam gur bhakti, janam dusre naam, janam tisre turiya pad, chauthe menej daam. It's from that statement of his that people began to talk of four lives. Translated, it means one life is good enough for developing love and devotion for a master. Second life is good to get initiated and work on it. Third life is good to reach the universal mind state of Turiyapad. And the fourth life definitely should be in such kind. Now when he laid out this, it was a general statement that this is not a one life program. It takes place that you can have an experience of love and devotion, then you experience initiation, then you experience uh, growth inside, then finally you go back home. So the time period was not laid out as hard and fast rule. On the other hand, uh, my father, there's a personal experience he had. 
that he he did not attend a satsang of great master but in that great master said no person who's initiated ever comes back in more than four lifetimes in the physical world so he went back to great master after that and he said master i miss your satsang today but i heard that you said in the satsang that no person who's initiated by a perfect living master ever comes into uh, this life more than four times good four lives great master laughed he said lekraj that was my father's name lekraj why are you asking this this is your last life you don't have to come again and my father said but master i was asking this question because maybe i like to come the fifth time <laughs> is there a bar on that <laughs> and he said why would you like to come on the fifth time he said i hear master sometimes come again and again and if you choose to come again i would like to come back again with you so master then explained great master explained that if a person who is initiated follows the directions of the master does meditation as is advised and follows the dietary and other small restrictions he places to keep the discipline of meditation intact if he follows these directions this is his last life he don't come second time only if you cannot follow these directions properly that you get a second life to complete the task and if you leave the path and run away only then he is called back to come on a third life and if you go against the master and say this was all bogus humbug i said fake thing i don't like it run away then only you come on the fourth life so he says fourth life is not the rule the rule is one life but there are instances where a person can come yes then ishwar um dia had a question uh she couldn't be here because she doesn't know why she thought she made the reservation and everything and then she thought why she put put the card number in the computer and it didn't work for her reservation but she only found out at the very last second and it's not a question that she was asking she said my lesson i think is just to surrender and understand but i guess a greater question would be when the unexpected happens and the disciple questions the will of the master uh and in the surrender what is our best response well the mind's nature is to question great master used to encourage questioning i find some masters some people on the spiritual path say don't ask questions just follow that becomes a cult you know that's not a spiritual path where you cannot even ask questions where you cannot satisfy your mind and move forward the doubt will always remain in your head the mind's doubt does not go away just by itself the mind's doubt the great master used to say is like a snake in a basket the snake want to come and bite you with that doubt but you put the lid on it say no oh, snake is now gone and even after a long time you open the lid the snake still comes out and bites you so the doubts in the mind are like that the doubts and if you try to shut them out and say no, no i am not supposed to question i am not supposed to question and get an answer to my doubt the doubt remains it keeps on hitting you from time to time therefore great master said you must clear your doubts sometimes he would say that people who are intellectual who study lot of books study lot of different paths they have more doubts than people who have studied nothing and therefore they take longer to go over the initial phase of the spiritual path because they have to get all the answers to their questions and they should get the answers to their questions so that the doubts disappear the reason why masters answer the questions of the mind is because the mind is the only thing in our way in getting good answers the mind says yes that makes sense that makes sense and you move on otherwise the mind doesn't let you move on so that is why questions are asked and doubts are resolved by asking questions and getting answers so the good response is if somebody says i surrender to the master and it's a mechanical mental thing that because book says you should surrender so i surrender but the doubt i am not sure what it is all like that doubt will creep in so doubt has to be resolved there there have been people i met one in lithuania and he he had been initiated in india by a master 
and he came up from to Europe, and from there he came and saw me. An Indian guy named Anu. Yeah, you were in Delhi. He came, and although initiated, he could not make any progress because he had doubt about the whole path, and nobody was there to give answers and remove his doubt. So he had to come all the way to see me in another European city to get the doubts removed, and now he'll make progress. So that means doubts can hold you back, even when you feel that you are on the right path, but the doubt has not been resolved. So doubts have to be resolved, and the best way is masters give us teachings. Master gives us things. Do this in this way. They make the path appealable to the mind, so that the mind may be kept out of the way. It's not that the teaching itself is spirituality. Great master used to say, even repetition of words and doing meditation, closing your eyes, is not spirituality. If you do it for the whole life, close your eyes and sit every day and repeat the same word like a parrot, you'll make no progress. The real secret of meditation and secret of the spiritual path is love and devotion. It does not involve closing your eyes. It does not involve the body. Love and devotion comes from the soul, from the spirit. The spiritual path is based on love and devotion, but the mind comes in the way. Therefore, the teachings have been prescribed to keep the mind out of the way. So. Surrender mentally is all right, but the doubts have to be removed. <clears throat> When the master said that it's not you walking to satsang, it's the master inside the disciple. It's <clears throat> not you doing the simran; it's actually the master inside of you, repeating the words. When that happens, to get yourself out of the way, what have you done to release the ego? You have done by listening to the master repeating the words inside you. You have done by walking the master walk in your body, and that's all that's needed. You don't need to do anything more. Now I want to emphasize that the power of listening is a power of the soul. If there was no soul, we couldn't listen. The power of speaking is not the power of the soul; it's the power of the mind. So inside us. In consciousness, there are two powers built in: the power of speaking and the power of listening. The mind speaks; the soul listens. Now, speaking doesn't mean speaking with the tongue; even speaking with the mind. Thinking is the speaking of the mind. When we are thinking in any kind of words, any kind of language, it's the mind speaking in our head. And how do we know the mind is speaking? Because we listen to it. The soul listens to the mind speaking, and we call it thinking. When the mind speaks in the head, and the soul listens, we call it thinking. And then thinking distracts us; takes all distractions, detachments go away. When thinking attaches us to various things, so the process starts from there. The secret of going back again is listening. That means if you repeat the words and only know that you are repeating, you don't make any progress. If you listen to what you are repeating, you make progress. Listening is the key, not the speaking. Even in Simran, even in repetition of words, when you repeat words, how intently you can listen to what you are repeating makes for progress. So remember, listening is the key, and not the speaking. Yes. So, listening is the best way to then you that quiets your mind. When you listen to your soul, that soothes the mind. Yes, the more you listen, the more quiet the mind becomes. The listening to the words of the simran, or listening to the shabad thun inside, listening to the sound inside, both quieten the mind. The more you concentrate on listening, less on speaking, the more your mind becomes quiet. Listening is the key. Yes, right. It's a comment more than a question. I've discovered that. The life itself, the way the Lord has created us, life itself is repetition. We get up in the morning, we brush our teeth, we take a shower, you know, we go to work, we deal with our families and loved ones. Not everybody does it. I, I see people with bad mouth smelling. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they all did what you were saying. <laughs> And, you know, in general, repetition is part of our lives. 
And that repetition has been built into the spiritual path. It's something that we do automatically. So he's made it easy in that sense that the repetition that we are used to doing in whatever we do can be applied to the spiritual path and make it that much more easy. It's, not, it's almost like it's not something that we're not used to doing. We are used to being repetitive in everything. And because we're repetitive in everything, when we decide to sit in meditation and do the simmering, the simmering is repetitive. The question is, like I said, they have a question. The question then remains, as you're doing the simmering and you're, at, you're engaged with the master in meditation, just like anything else your mind deals with, there's a certain level of your attention gets distracted, you become distracted by something or another of a different thought than the repetition or even the viewing of the master, whether imaginatively or otherwise. You can become distracted because the mind is that powerful. What would you suggest to be the most, or well, the best way, I should say, to keep the mind stable, focused like a laser beam, so that when the thoughts come in, whatever they are, you can, you know, ward it off and stay with your concentration. What you call repetition, great master called habit. He says the mind is used to forming habits. That means if it forms a habit, it automatically becomes repeated. That's the habit of the mind. Mind can get habituated to anything. The answer to your question great master gives is, make the repetition of Simran a habit. Instead of just practicing by speaking, make it a habit. How do you make it a habit? By not using repetition only at the time of meditation, but all the time. While walking, while working, while cooking, while doing any other job, wherever the mind is not occupied in a concentrated work on something, where the attention is not needed to be concentrated on an external task, keep repeating the words, the mind will get habituated to repeating. If it gets habituated, you will see when you go to sleep at night, the mind will by habit start repeating the words. And therefore, the task becomes much easier. If the mind is repeating the words by habit, all you have to do is to listen to what the mind is saying. So Simran becomes easier by creating a habit of repetition. Yes? When we, when we have a problem and we and solve it by listening. Many problems are solved by listening insight. And then the solution comes as the master doing the work for us and we surrender to listening. That's right. The more you practice listening, the more you will find answers coming automatically into your head. It's a very great art. The art of listening is the most important art. But we, we speak too much, both externally with our mouth and internally with our mind. We don't need to speak so much. When you have a repetition, the mind has to keep on saying something. So when you practice and make a habit of repeating the Simran, then the mind doesn't think of so many other things. He's repeating the Simran all the time. Every opportunity comes, you're repeating the Simran. You feel something is not going to happen good, is negative. Simran takes the negativity away, you repeat the Simran. Ultimately, it becomes a habit, becomes, meditation becomes very easy after that. And listening gives the answers inside. Yes? And uh, meditation, you do the Simra and the Diyan and then the Prajan. When you listen, to, when you say you listen to the sound, it's not a mental activity that you are anticipating to catch that sound. You just surrender and the sound will come by itself because the thinking and the, and the sound, the, the word, are contradictory. If you think you want, you want, you want to bring it or be attentive to it, to, to pick it up, I don't see what the two you, you are right. Thinking does not allow this listening to the bhajan at all. The more you are thinking of various things, the less chance of hearing a sound inside. But when you're repeating, 
you are replacing the thinking with repetition of mantra, repetition of Simran. When you are repeating those words, they are taking the same place in the thought stream as a thought would be. So you are blocking many thoughts of coming by repetition of those words. With practice, if you make the Simran a consistent thing in your consciousness, the sound comes automatically because there are fewer thoughts. But I agree with you, thoughts are contrary to the sound being heard. But Simran is a preparation for the sound to come. In fact, you'll be surprised, Simran has no other function. We think Simran is going to take us to God. No, it doesn't. What does Simran do? Simran prepares you for the sound. Simran prepares you by wiping out thoughts which would otherwise take place in the conscious stream in your head. And you begin to repeat the same words over and over again. They are replacing the words of thought. Ultimately, they replace almost all words of thought and your attention is on the words. The attention goes only by listening to the words. When you put your attention on listening to the words, ultimately the sound comes automatically because you're not thinking too much. So it has to come automatically, you don't bring it. No, no, you don't, you don't force yourself to hear the sound. If you force yourself, it will never be the real sound. Yes. Yeah. On that point, is it true that Great Master Sound said to do more bhajan than Simran? He said that in order to have bhajan, in order to listen to the sound, you have to prepare yourself with Simran. Therefore, in his instructions at the time of initiation, he would say, you should do about one-tenth of your total time in every 24 hours in meditation, which means two and a half hours. He recommended that in the beginning do two hours of Simran, only half an hour of bhajan or listening to the sound. The sound won't come. And the sound that comes in the beginning are artificial sounds which have many physical sounds. Some are sounds being created by the body functions. Some are even the blood circulating, the heartbeat, and many sounds are not at all really spiritual sounds. So you practice them just for the sake of listening with your attention to the sounds. Similar for two hours. As you grow and sounds begin to become good and melodious and are no longer the physical sounds, you increase the time for the bhajan, decrease the sound for the simran. If the sound can be heard all the time, whether you close your ears or not, whether you're sitting in meditation or not, simran becomes unnecessary. That's what great master said. And it's true. And then, is it, thank you, is it also true that he said that the sound, listening to the sound current will burn more of the sanchit karmas? Sanchit karma is burnt. Or not. Sanchit karma is burnt at initiation. It burns even your pralabdha karma. Pralabdha, yes. Listening to the sound burns even your current destiny karma and lightens it up. And ultimately you find very light. What happens is that karma is an experience. If supposing you say, my leg is hurt, got an injury, I don't feel the pain. You're not paying any karma off. If the leg is injured, you're not even feeling the pain. What kind of karma are you paying? When you have pain, you say, now I'm being pain. Now you're being punished for what you did. That's payoff of karma. The injury to the leg is not the karma. The pain is the payoff of the karma. When you do more listening to the sound, the pain seems to disappear. The injury is still there. The external appearance of the karmic process is still there, but you don't feel it. Therefore, the karma is being burnt. The beautiful thing that you can burn your karma. You can burn your pralabdha even. Since it is burnt already by initiation, and pralat can be burnt by meditation. Yes, Tiki. You were talking about karma's earth, and um, I had a question about the masters. Because they don't really have any karmas of their own anymore. So don't you. Nobody has any real karma. <laughs> only mind has karma. None of us has any karma. Our mind only has karma. Mind creates karma, mind goes through karma, mind goes through pain and pleasure, mind goes through good and evil. We identify ourselves, we think we are the mind, so we have karma. The masters do not have karma because they do not think the mind is their self. If we think the mind is not our self and we realize it, we have no karma either. There is no difference between the masters and us except awareness. They know it and we don't. 
the system is still the same. It's not that they have a different body, different soul, different... They are the same thing like us. But the awareness is that they know it. They know it all the time. And we don't know. Even glimpses we get once in a while. That's the difference. Yes, Dwight? One more. When the disciple goes in and is acquiring these cities where the disciple acquires powers, does the disciple have the ability to use those powers if he or she finds himself or herself in a fix or needs to use the powers to fix a situation, a personal situation? The cities that you're talking of, there are two kinds, Hridis and Siddhis. Hridis are inherent powers of energy within us and we can deal with them with our energies. We come across problems every day, don't we solve them? We solve them with the energy in us. We have to overcome an obstacle, we jump over it. We have to solve a mathematical problem, we solve it. These are Hridis. All these Hridis are operating from our energy centers below our eyes. Siddhis are a control over those riddhis, that you can sit them. Sid means to control them, make them within your own volition. So when you control these energies, then you get the powers of siddhi. So siddhi powers are used by the energies below. They do not employ your awareness. In fact, if you use your siddhis, you move yourself away from awareness. And therefore, people who are disciples of perfect living masters, who have been taught not to go below the eyes in their meditation. When they employ Siddhis, they lose the other benefits of meditation. So the advice is, don't go after Siddhis and Riddhis. Use the Siddhi of the master instead. Somebody asked me, why don't you have proper white hair? I said, why should I have? Master should have. <laughs> white hair, if it comes by worry, he should have it. Why should I have? If the Siddhis have to be used, why should I use the Siddhi? Let him use it. So that's the surrender that when you really feel that the Master is within you and working within you and you leave things to the Master to do it, you will, like an autom automaton, like a robot, perform the functions. People will think you are doing it and you will know Master is doing it. No Siddhis are needed for that. Yes? Like if you were the question when you're in the world and you'd say, you know, who controls everything, you might say that's God. Um, and if we can't see God and know God, then what we're seeing like in a master is kind of like maybe a perfect human being, almost like a per person that, like you say, has those qualities of love, forgiveness, compassion. So, when a disciple's a wrong master, I mean, is that in a way, like, I mean, the ultimate seeking would be like God, even though we don't know anything about it. I mean, you could say that, but what do we know? We only know what we can see. So, it, all, it all depends on the definition of God. Yeah, so I mean... What is the I'm, definition of God? Supposing the definition of God is a power sitting somewhere hidden from us, but who controls everything, has made up everything, exists in everything, exists in us, but we can't see him. That God you can never see. No human being has ever seen such a God. The only way to see such a God is to become God yourself. Because by the time you're God, there's nobody else at all. Where there is God, there's no one else. He's totality. Therefore, if somebody says, can man see God? The answer is no. But can man see God in some other form than God? But having the same godly qualities? Yes, in the form of a perfect living master. Because he will have all the qualities and awareness, not only qualities. He will have all the awareness that God has. And yet he is somebody that can be seen. But not in the physical body, not as a being, you cannot see God. Therefore, we have made so many different definitions of God. They are man-made. Every person that I have ever talked to in my life who talks about God has a mental image made up by himself. Nobody has seen God. 
nobody has talked to God. They talk to their mind and call it God. Therefore, God cannot be neither seen, nor spoken to, nor realized like this. It's all our mind. Ultimately, even in meditation that people are doing with various masters in this world, they're looking at their own mind and the universal mind and calling it the ultimate God. And say, we found the ultimate God, he was the universal mind. They're still confused by the mind and call it God. So the definitions of God are so different. So in the Indian pantheology of gods, they said, forget about it, we have plenty of gods. We have got Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, we've got smaller gods. We've got a god who has an elephant head. We've got a god who's got a monkey head. we got all kinds of animals. The Greeks had so many. And the Egyptians had even more animals sitting there, giving dictation to other people. A dog sitting there, and have you seen them? Birds and snakes, and they were all conscious gods. In the Greek tradition, the god was always a human being. They never thought god is some invisible being. They saw Hercules as god. They saw these other gods amongst them. They were all human beings. Enlightened human beings were called gods. So definitions of god have changed throughout the ages in different cultures. But the religion, the standard religion, makes us believe that god is separate from us. That we have to worship that god. And we can't see him. And we may sometimes speak to him and feel his presence. So they confuse themselves a lot by talking to their own mind and thinking they're talking to God. The messages from God come into our head. They're all mind's messages, mental messages. I want to see a single person who gets a message in a spoken word from somewhere beyond the mind. It's impossible. So that's why we get confused by the very term God. So I hardly ever use the word God, you might notice. I say totality of consciousness. is the creator. We called it God, ultimate God. Now, why do I say ultimate God? Because there's so many gods. When you are sitting in this world and you say, who is God that we worship in Christianity? He is the Lord of the astral plane. Who is the God that the Hindus say is Ishwar, Parmeshwar, Niranjan? He's the Lord of the astral plane. Who is Allah? The Muslims are always saying, who gave us the Alam and gave Quran. He, Lord of the astral plane. Why? He's the creator of the a whole astral plane, whole physical plane, the creator of this universe. That's the definition of God. He created this universe. It's being created from the astral plane. They don't even have any idea that there's anything beyond that. Then other people say, no, 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 this is not the real God. There's a higher God than that. Who's the higher God? Who created the three universes? Who created time and space? And we go up above to Brahman. And Brahma is the creator, the ultimate God. They're still confused. I said, no, there's no God higher up. When you have an experience built upon layers of consciousness, every layer creates a different creator and a different God. Not only that, supposing you have no perfect living master and a master of a lower order who has thought that the God that we worship in church and temple and mosque, he is the ultimate God and teaches you to reach the God in the astral plane, you will think you have reached such God. There is no way you can find out that there is any such cult because it's a complete system. You see the creator, you see the world being created, you see this whole physical world being created from the astral. What else can there be? The mind does not expect, mind does not see anything beyond. Even initiates of perfect living masters, when they reach the astral plane, they think we have reached such cult. The master has to goad them to move forward. This is not it. We have to go forward. But we see the creator sitting right here. So that's the creator of this lower universe. There's more than that. There's still time and space. All the gods that we worship are all working in time and space. In the beginning was this, then they did this, then they did that. It took six days, seven days to do this. They did take a million years, they took. They take three million years. They took three seconds. It's all time created universe. It's being created by those who are within this realm of time. The ultimate creator, the total consciousness, exists way, way beyond time. Way beyond all these thoughts that we can have. Way beyond the mind. So that's why, unless a perfect living master comes from that totality, we can have no idea whatsoever. And we think that's God when we come to the very first stage. So we ultimately discover there's more and more. And the great master used to take disciples above by telling them, this is not it. 
move forward. So at every stage we think we have reached the end and we have reached our destination and not the destination. We're very lazy. Hmm? We're very lazy. Well, not always. In some worldly activities we are very private and quick. When it comes to meditation we are lazy. It's only for some things we are lazy. And we are very selective. The mind says, you know, we have plenty of time to do meditation. After all, we have, we have bills to pay, we have to work, we have our social responsibilities, kids to take care of, other relations to take care of, business to take care of. We are working, we are human beings, we are ordinary human beings. We have to take care of everything around us. Meditation is a small part. We can't give more than 10 minutes to it. We, we don't have time. We are so busy, we have no time. And all our priorities go awry, all go wrong. Because of that kind of thinking. We are spending time and attention on things and when we die, we realize, what did we do? These things are just disappearing right in front of our eyes. We took so much care. Oh, we have to get our house painted. This is very important. The window is breaking up. You die, the house is disappearing in front of you. Children are disappearing in front of you. Everything is disappearing. So what, I wasted all my life on this? And what is now appearing, I never gave any attention to it. It's too late. You're dead. The opportunity finished. So the great master and other perfect masters come and tell us, now is the opportunity. And there is that book, glimpses of great master, they publish pictures of great master. And in the beginning of that book, they have put an autograph. I don't know if some of you have seen. It's in a book called Glimpses of Great Master, of Baba Savan Singh. And the opening, they have put a little oblong thing on which the signature that he wrote. Which card now or do, do it now? Or yes. He says, Mil Jagdish Milan Ki Biriya. That's what he writes in Urdu. He says, meet the Lord, now is the time. That means do not think tomorrow is the time. It's always now. Don't waste even a moment. Don't waste this useful time that you have because only as a human being with a human consciousness, with human seeking, human free will, do you, have, do you have a chance? Otherwise, too late. We all discover at the time of death, oh, we should have been different. Too late. You come again and you forget everything again and say, oh, we have other, other things to do. Very big responsibilities. What about our kids? What about our jobs? What about paying bills? You can't be ordinary human beings. And you teach us to give priority to meditation. How can we do that? How can we ignore all these things? Now, the truth is, if you meditate regularly, you become so efficient in doing everything else. You can do everything so much better. And you almost feel you are not doing it. That the master is doing it. Things work so smoothly just because you set your priorities right. That you are giving a higher priority to the spiritual path, higher priority to your meditation than the rest of anything. When you set your priorities right, everything runs smoothly. It's not that you have to give up the world to do meditation. It's not that kind of meditation at all. It's not that you have to become a monk and go into monastery or you have to become an ascetic and run into a forest to meditate. You are right in the middle of the world. You are right in the middle of a household. You have children, you have family, you have everything. And everything is being taken care of while you are meditating properly. So, people say, no, I can't meditate. I am short of sleep. I can't sleep. Try meditation. You don't need that much sleep. No, but you know, I have to earn my living and eat my food and all that. You don't need so much food. You don't need anything so much if you meditate properly, if your priorities are right. So our priorities are wrong. We are putting priority on things which are totally temporary and will go away. We'll see it going away. Then it will be too late. So it's better to see it now. And here these perfect living masters are coming and telling us that, look, time is short. It's a very small window that opens. After that, the window comes after a long time based on our karma. If our karma is such heavy that we have to go through several other forms of life before we become human, you can imagine how rare the window of opportunity is. The window of opportunity is only the physical human life. So 
don't waste it. One man went to great master. He said, Master, I want not to lose an opportunity to make me a human being in my next life. Great master said, are you a donkey now? <laughs> you want to wait for next life. You are a human being now. <laughs> do what you want to do now. So we, we don't uh, take advantage of this opportunity. And therefore, if you set your priorities right, I have been one of the busiest people in worldly activities here. I'm only looking at my own life. I had three jobs. I was working three jobs, taking 22 hours of my time for seven months. The sleep was only two hours in a car, moving from one station to another, to another job. For seven months, I did three jobs, never felt tired, never felt it was too much, never complained. How is it possible? Just the right priority. That master can do anything. I have to spend my time with the master. He'll do everything outside. So I am not talking from some book that I've read. I'm telling you experientially that these things happen. You do not become less qualified to do your worldly duties if you are meditating properly. If you give high priority to meditation, you'll still be able to do your duties, worldly duties, better than you're doing now. Your mind will be more clear. Your decision making will be absolutely correct and on the dot every time. Not that you have to start thinking, maybe I should not do this, maybe I will do it. All the maybes and perhapses will finish in your life if your priorities are right. So therefore meditation is not something that you have to give up your life to go and do it. You do it right in the middle of life and doing everything else that you are required to do. And the beauty is in order to do worldly work, you can make the worldly work into meditation. Great master's own grandson, <clears throat> Maharaj Charan Singh's brother, Vashwatam Singh, he joined the military and became a young second lieutenant in the army. And he was posted to another station, an army base somewhere. He came on a vacation and talked to great master. He said, master, I am very unhappy that I wanted to spend my life in the spiritual path at your feet. I wanted to serve you and practice love and devotion and meditation. And now what has happened? I've joined the army. I'm so far away from you. And I should resign and come back and serve you. Great Master said, go back to your station and do your duty thinking that the Master has asked you to do the duty. If you do your duty as an army lieutenant, thinking that I'm doing great master duty, it'll count exactly like meditation sitting at my feet. What else could he say? It's not the physical proximity that matters. It's the mental proximity. If your mind is close to the master, you are close to the master. And therefore, the other day, uh, David Lee sent me a, a letter of great master written many years ago to a disciple saying, who wants to come uh, to, come to India from the United States, to be closer to the master. The master says it's not the physical closeness that matters. It's that you, you can travel to India without using your body. If you are close to the master inside, you're close to him physically also. So therefore, don't worry about the physical uh, distance that you think there is between the master. Of course, it's always good to be able to see the physical form if we haven't seen the inner form. Once you see the inner form, it makes no difference. When you see the radiant form of a master inside, it does not really matter, though you still like to see the physical form, because now the physical form looks different. When you see the radiant form of your own master inside in meditation, then you look at the physical form and say, wow, this is the same guy here. See how he's behaving, pretending to be an ordinary person. That's how you feel. Look at this guy. I know him. I know him because I've seen him. And he's still talking like he knows nothing, as if he's just an ordinary person like us. It gives you a puzzle, but it makes more, it makes the mystery of the relationship with the master even more interesting and more enjoyable. I was once standing with the great master in Dalhousie, a hill station. We were standing in the, in the garden. He was walking in the morning. I happened to be there and I was walking with him. And we were looking at the beautiful mountains, snow covered mountains and beautiful trees and flowers growing in that garden. And I mentioned to 
subject master that look how beautiful these things are looking and he said when you go inside they are even more beautiful the view inside is even more beautiful the mountains are more beautiful even in the astral plane the mountains more beautiful the sky is more bright the colors are more beautiful the flowers are alive inside yes big big experience but once you have had that experience when you come out even these look more beautiful so i made a point that if you have the reality behind you and seen it illusion looks even better and great master used to give an example of how the illusion can be made to look better than reality he said that once upon a time there was a competition between the japanese and the chinese uh, in the court of the emperor the emperor had invited must be the emperor of india or emperor of china or somebody big emperor he invited painters from around the world to come and paint on his walls of the palace and whoever does the best painting he'll give an award there was a painting contest on the wall a wall mural to be painted so the ultimate finalists were a japanese and a chinese team and they were given the wall opposite walls in the same hall but he put a curtain in the middle so they don't copy each other so the japanese were preparing the wall polishing it all the time the chinese were crafting very beautiful paintings putting the best color on them they were given 7 days to complete the task on the 6th day the emperor came and saw the japanese still polishing the the wall and when will they start painting so the chinese had almost completed the work so on the last day when the emperor came they had just polished the wall the chinese had done a beautiful painting when they removed the curtain the the reflection of that of the chinese painting on the wall was even better than the original painting so the reflection was even better and they won the award and <laughs> they painted just the reflection so his master says if you have the original you see in the original the reflection will look more beautiful because you now know where it's coming from you know the reality of the illusion this uh, this business of illusion and reality is a very interesting subject according to me and confusing too it is very easy to say after reading some books and hearing satsangs and stories that this world is unreal it's an illusion i have never found a person who thinks it's illusion he says it's illusion put a pen prick on him and he crouches ouch if it is illusion why is he say ouch why does he experience the pain and pleasure of this world so real if it is illusion everything should be illusion even with enlightenment uh, the illusion still remains real story is told of a mystic named shankar in india shankar was in bombay and he was walking down the street and his leading disciple who was the most advanced disciple of his was right behind him and shankar saw a snake on the ground he said to the leading disciple what do you see here he said sir it's a rope it's just a piece of rope looks like a snake in reality it's a rope in illusion it's a snake he said if it is a rope and you know it just pick it up it's just a piece of rope it's not a snake he said yes sir so he picked up the snake the snake crawled around his arm and bit him it is ouch he said now tell me is it a snake or a rope he said master it's a rope looks like a snake why did you say ouch he said the rope bites like a snake <laughs> the point was simple <laughs> that we have not used illusion to create illusion we have used illusion to create reality if you want to know what is actually real if you ask me the simple ultimate question tell me what is ultimately real i'll say nothing is real you can anybody explain what is real it's all created if what is created is illusion if what is created by consciousness is illusion everything is illusion including such kind of true permanent home is created so the definition of reality would be 
the creator. Definition of reality would be the experiencer. The definition of reality would be one that perceives illusion as reality. The perceiver may be real. That's the only definition I can give. Everything else is illusion and created. Therefore, nothing is real. On the other hand, the creator is not creating illusions. What to create reality? Therefore, there are levels of reality being created, not levels of illusion. When we say these are different levels of, of consciousness, it does not mean they are levels of illusions. The process of illusion, the process of creating something by pure consciousness has been used to create reality. So therefore, when we say it's real, we judge it as real from the perception we have of that reality with means at our disposal within that reality. We don't judge it from means outside of the reality, which means, supposing I am asked, is this cup of water real? I'll say, I can touch it. Hmm, I taste it too. I put it on the table, table is hard too. It's real. How am I testing reality? I'm testing reality by the means being created at the same level as the cup. I am taking the cup to be real because I am testing its reality with everything else. Supposing I was sleeping, having a dream. In the dream also, I saw the same cup. In the dream also, somebody asked me, is the cup real or not? And I will do the same thing in a dream. I will take up the cup. Hmm, I can drink the water. The table is real. And the cup therefore is real. And then I wake up. Neither the cup was real, nor the table, nor the water I tasted. How could I call it real when waking up destroys the whole reality? Waking up from a dream has destroyed the whole reality. The reason is I had no way to compare the cup or the table or anything that I saw in the dream with the wakeful state. The wakeful state was totally different. And I was trying to test the reality of the cup in relation to the reality of everything else at the same level of consciousness. Therefore, everything remained real to me till I woke up. It's the same thing in this physical world. In the physical world, we are testing out reality by putting one sense perception against another and saying, because I can touch it, taste it, smell it, it's real. And when we wake up to a higher level of consciousness, all that disappears. And we find the reality lays somewhere else. It is merely a reflection, a dream from that state. And we say, now that must be real, because now we are a dream. When we wake up one step more, that becomes unreal. It's just created reality. He said, maybe where does it end? We keep on waking up, ultimately, the ultimate person wakes up and says, I don't even exist. Only the power to dream exists. The power to dream, the dreamer exists, and he must dream in order to be a dreamer. If the dream finishes, the even dreamer disappears. Therefore, if creation disappears, the creator disappears. And therefore, the creator for his own sustenance, for being a permanent creator, must have permanent creation. And the more levels he creates, the more permanent he becomes. What a good mental explanation. <laughs> so the truth is that whenever we talk of reality, we are always talking of a relative reality. We are talking of a reality at one level of consciousness and we have no means to test it. Nobody, even advanced meditators I have come across, they cannot hold two levels of consciousness together at the same time. You cannot be deep in sleep, having a deep dream, a terrible dream, in which you are being chased by your robbers and things and that. Terrible things are happening. At the same time, you can't be awake to be able to say, oh, that's just a dream. You may even say in the dream, I know it's a dream, but you're still telling everybody else, dream, run. Run from here, it's a dream. That means you don't even know it's a dream. You're still speaking the truth. In this wakeful state, people speak the truth. It's illusion, but they don't know it. There's no awareness of it. There's no experience of it. The experience of the illusion of a reality only comes when you wake up to the next level of consciousness. Not simple enlightenment that there is another level. Not simple glimpse of something that's unusual. That's not enlightenment. That's not wakefulness. To be awake to another level of consciousness, you should be as awake 
as you get up from sleep, from a dream, and say, that was a dream. And I know it. Don't look for proof for that. Has anybody ever looked for proof? People wake up every morning from sleep. I've never seen a person saying, I'm now going to search for proof whether I'm awake or not. I've never seen a person saying, no, that was not a dream. Maybe that was real and now I am dreaming. Except one philosopher. Fahim, he said so. Chinese philosopher. He said that he had a dream in which he was a butterfly. And the butterfly was flitting around in a garden. The flowers were so beautiful. The colors were so beautiful he had never seen in his life. They do not exist in the physical world. But in the dream, they were there. And the butterfly, and he did not feel he saw a butterfly going around. He was the butterfly. He was flapping his wings and going around everywhere. He had no notion there could be anything else other than a butterfly. The butterfly was going through all the flowers and he woke up. And he finds he is a philosopher. And he wrote. He says, I am not sure if I am really Fahim the philosopher who had a dream that he was a butterfly or I am really a butterfly who is now dreaming that he is Fahim the philosopher. How do I determine the difference? So the difference is determined by the imminent knowledge, imminent awareness of the difference of level of consciousness on waking up from one level to another. Which means when you are sleeping and having a dream and you wake up, you recall. That point is not mentioned very clearly that you recall you were sleeping and after that sleep when you went to bed, then the dream came and you woke up. Even before you opened your eyes, you remembered you had gone to bed. That's the connection. It's a memory connection with the past in that level that convinces you it was only a dream. If you did not have that connection, you would be confused like Fahim, the philosopher. That you wouldn't know if the dream was real or wakefulness is real. Then you'd be sent to a mental house. You know. Then you'd be locked up in a nut house. But if you remember, if your memory is good enough to remember who you are, then normal sleep, a normal dream. Then you go about your daily business. In the same way, in the spiritual path, when you are able to wake up to the astral plane, you do not feel you come to some new place. You were there already. You were there even while you were here. But you had shut that experience off and operated that experience through the physical body and the physical system to generate the reality of this physical world. When you wake up, you discover that you were already there and you were using that very system to have a physical dream or a physical life. And that you were there much earlier than you were in the physical body in this physical world. So your life was much longer there. And you remember that your name was not what you think it was. You just gave that name in the physical body. Your name was different. And I have some people have come to me and say, how do we know who we are? I said, give a different name to yourself and check it out, whether that was your name. Because you will find that in one astral life, the average length in time of that astral life is between from 1,000 to 3,000 physical earth years. The average life. That means we have been in the same astral body from 1,000 to 3,000 of physical years. In 1,000 or 3,000 physical years for an enlightened person, one who has been enlightened enough to know that this is what happened, that person does not go back into other species but is born from human to human. We have had several human lives in that 1,000, 3,000 period. In every human life, we had a different name for our body. And when we are there, which is our real name? We had so many names in the physical body. And do we have a particular name there? Now, astral life is so different from physical life. Here, we are given a name to our body. And we think that's our name. When we are called by that name, we think our whole self is being called by that name. We don't distinguish this is the name of our body and we may have another name somewhere else. We can't even think of it. In the astral body, you discover that was a local topical label given to us. And that we've had several labels. And a new name comes up, which flip-flops to all the names that you have ever had. 
So your name is not what you think is in one life. So astral life is so different that way. There are many differences. There's one of the differences that language and use of vocabulary and language is very different there than it's in the physical world. In the physical world, I went to Lithuania, they spoke in Lithuania and I couldn't understand. I need an interpreter. If it was the astral plane and they had spoken Lithuanian, I would have understood without interpreter. Because there, the spoken language means nothing. The spoken language is just a conveyance of what you are thinking. And the thoughts are captured directly in the language of the recipient. That means you can speak Pashto, other person will hear it in English. It's an automatic translation system going on. Not because of translation, but because what a person says in spoken language is designed in the mind as a message. The message remains the same no matter what language you use. The message is conveyed to the other person and gets translated into the language, spoken language of that person. And that's why it doesn't matter. In, in even in physical, occasional telepathic experiences, I don't know how many of you have had telepathic experience. If somebody has thought something, you are able to understand it at a distance without spoken communication or written communication or iPhones or telephones. If you have been able to read what the other person says, it doesn't matter at all what language the other person used. You will understand in your language, even in this physical world. The telepathic experience is actually an astral experience that can occasionally happen in physical world. Like so many other astral experiences can take place in the physical life also. So it's very interesting. It's so such a great adventure. We came into this world for adventure. I tell you, the journey back is also quite a bit of adventure. You'll find many adventurous things on the way back. So adventurous that many disciples, even of great master, are stuck there enjoying the adventure. Then let's enjoy this first before we go to Sajkan. Khan. <laughs> the more attractive than even the so-called distraction and attractiveness of this world. There's too many heavens built there, which is probably another form of the trap. According to me, that's also a trap, that you can be uh, held to attractions even when you're on the way back to your own home. But they exist. Yes. Yes, sir, thank you. Well, why does the master need the disciple? And then, are there any recordings of Great Master Solomon's voice? Oh. Could you describe it? The voice was never recorded. But it was written down, what he spoke. There was a, there was a man who wrote down every word that Master spoke. And there used to be a local magazine in which they were published. And uh, uh, there may be some old copies of that magazine in which all the original spoken words are there. Because there was recording equipment then to record his voice. No. There wasn't? No. There was no recording equipment. It was never used. Huh. It might have been there in other countries, but there was none in the Dera. Huh. But people recorded in hand, which was the old traditional way of recording. Just right in shorthand. And the master's uh, words, although sometimes he spoke in Punjabi, were recorded in Urdu, in Urdu language. And I saw those recordings. I saw that they were published uh, in a magazine uh, in, in, the, in the Dera itself. And uh, some records of it are available. The other day, I showed a book to some of you. I don't know who saw the yes. book. You saw uh, the book where the original words of Baba Jamal Singh have been recorded. And that's also, uh, there's, it's a translation from the Gurmukhi Punjabi language. And there's one sheet that, that contains the actual handwriting in which he wrote himself. So at some point, I'll show you that. It's just out of curiosity how the recordings were done at that time. Uh, Bibi Raj can show you but uh, from Minneapolis. Yes, I have uh, got uh, the two books, two volumes, which were printed way, way back, about 80 years ago or 75 years ago, very old books. 
and they're really, really old. But my daughter, Simi, in San Francisco is collecting all the old books. So I promised to give those to her because she's collecting anything that's old. She asked me, her daughter, my granddaughter, Simi's daughter asked, I would like to see the original writing of my grandfather, Lake Rajpuri, and the original writing of Great Master. So this was a request she made. And the request was sent to my sister, who is in New Delhi, Chandar, who came, some of you met here. Chandar, by strange coincidence, at that very time, found that my father had sent a registered, insured letter to Great Master, and that you had to fill up a form, say, insured and sent to um, Hazur, Sant Maharaj, Baba Sawan Singh, record, and Sawan Singh himself was signed on it. So both things that she was looking for are on one piece of paper. And she has now, the grand, granddaughter is now saving that as a unique antique piece. I may even have it on a photo, a photo of that. Like uh, David, I also sometimes copy these things on my iPhone. If I have it, I can even show you. Both and writings on the same little sheet. In the glimpses of the master, is that... Uh Great master's handwriting, what he said in Urdu? Yes, that's his writing. That's his own writing. And the Urdu is written right to left? Or left? Mil Jagdish Milan Ki Biriya is written in his own handwriting. Mil Jagdish, meet the Lord. This is the time to meet him. And there's a translation of it. If I can find it here, I might be able to show you. Quite a new electronic device, you know. We could never see these things in the good old days of the Dera. There were no iPhones. Here is a postal receipt which my father sent to Shri Hazur Sant Savan Singh Maharaj. And it's insured for 100 rupees. Whatever letter he sent must be important that he insured it for 100 rupees. And Savan Singh had to sign himself. Because it's insured, there's a signature also. Anybody like to see? Yes. Oh my God. Wow. There. <laughs> so this piece original I gave it to her because it contains both my father's yeah. handwriting as yeah. well as great master's handwriting. See, she's by coincidence found it. Semi fathers. Semi fathers. Semi. Semi. I gave the original to Semi's daughter Asha. She's collecting these. I just took it.